Welcome everybody. We move into the post tea break session. Um, it's a session which uh, kind of uh, the set, the session, the tone for the set uh, session I thought was nicely set by the Vachana Sahitya, which address things like caste and uh, differentiations and oral histories and the histories of people who have no histories. So I think uh, it's apt that. Uh, we have with us Professor Gopal Guru, who is uh, at the Center for Political Studies School of Social Sciences, JNU. Um, he particularly specializes in social and moral theory, socio-political thought in modern India, social movements. Uh, he has edited a book on humiliation uh, called Humiliation Claims and Context and Atropy in Dalit Politics. He's also written the book Cracked Mirror, uh, Indian Debate on Theory and Experience, with Sundar Sarukai. I'm stressing the second part because everyone call, keeps calling it the crack mirror. It's just not the crack mirror. It's a crack mirror which is a debate on theory and experience. And I think the second part of the book is more important than the first part. Uh, he's on the editorial board of several research journals like Social Change, Studies in Indian Politics, Lokmiti Journal and African Review. Uh, he's also received several fellowships and is a member of several academic bodies. Uh, Malcolm Adi Shesha Award for the year 2013 etc. have been some of the awards that have been given to him. Uh, he's also adjunct professor Manipal Center of Philosophy and Humanities and uh, we're very fond of him when he comes over here. So without further ado, uh, Professor Gopal, yeah, the stage is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Meera, for your uh, uh, introduction and a nice words that you spoke about me. I like that uh, last introduction of my adjunct professor at MCPH, Manipal University. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Gayatri and Nikhil uh, for inviting me to be in dialogue with uh, Professor Romina Tapar. Uh, we keep listening to her through YouTube, directly through books, but this is a rare opportunity that I am in face to face with her today. Uh, uh, so I'll just take about 20 minutes so that we have enough time for Professor Thapar and others to make comments. Uh, I'm going to uh, be in conversation with her on this particular book, The Aryan Recasting Constructs. It's a very, very suggestive title. And this is published by three essays in 2008. There are about five chapters. And those chapters were written from time to time during the last 40 years. And these are very important chapters. Out of the five chapters, I might focus only on the first three because they are so important as far as I can see that. Why they are important, why the whole book is so important. I have got six justifications to say why this, this book is so important. Why is the work important? That is the question I ask. Not only it has acquired a majestic status in the discursive field of history, but because it holds us and helps us to interrogate ill-founded assumptions of certain political forces in contemporary times, also helps us to look at, re-look at some of our own theoretical historical understanding more carefully and more closely. And therefore it is so important. This book, I mean every Every page has very, very important insights. So it's very difficult to summarize the book. I'm just uh, putting that book, uh, the whole discussion into some formulations later. So this is the first thing as to why it is so important for us to discuss this book uh, today. 
shakeable. It helps us to question the cultural practices of those social sections who are longing for becoming Aryan. For a very long time, certain members of the groups who consider themselves consider themselves to be culturally deprived such as such such as obcs and dalit obcs the, the earlier shudras shudra caste these groups have developed an acute desire to pack themselves into the category called aryan Thanks to these TV series like Ramayana and Mahabharata. And if you, Professor Thapar, if you look at the names that OBC parents are given to their children, Aryan and these and that, and they are all culturally different earlier. So this is a new trend. In Mumbai, in Mumbai, you find this uh, kind of Sanskritization, if you want to use that term. So this is second. That's why this book is, this book is actually interrogating the whole cultural aspiration of this, why should they really adopt? Is it a kind of a uh, empty signifier they are looking for? Or does it have any meaningful normative content in it? Do they really adopt these names self-reflectively or without reflection? And if that is without reflection, what is the political fallout of this whole thing, adoption to this? I am really worried about this. And this is slow but definite process happening among these groups. Therefore, I mean, I don't know whether they will read this book but they should read this book on priority. Second. Third. Professor Thapar's work is also important to understand the limits of internationalization of caste that certain Dalits are seeking through the mediation of race and through this mediation they are collapsing race into caste and this collapse of race into caste is also an opposition to Aryan race and I must really uh, uh, share with you this uh, Durban conference and certain NGO, Dalit NGOs are trying to internationalize their cause, social cause, not through caste, but collapsing caste into race against the category, which is active category, Aryan race. Therefore, this book, and I, you are raising important points, and I'm your follower in this. I, 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 there was a big debate, I think. Government of India is taking some different stance on it. We are not, we're not discussing that here at the moment. We're just discussing it academically as to why certain people should take this book so seriously for their own self-understanding if not doing immediate politics of survival and cultural signification that's, that's the limited uh, desire that I have and I expectation that I have, that I have about them this is the third justification as to why one should really read and uh, read openly, read collectively this book Three chapters, the, big, the three chapters are so absolutely important for detoxifying oneself, all this Aryanism. This is the third. And this is my own emphasis, you may not agree with me. Fourth, this work of hers is so important because it gives us an opportunity to evaluate attempts made by certain Dalit Bhojan organizations and you just and my major question is the hyphen between Dalit and the Bhojan Dalit Bhojan organization to define their authenticity or to put it to, to, to really foreground their indigenousness by constructing Aryans as the invading others and this has reference to Fule and you are stating his position so clearly and but desiring with him and I also join you desiring with, with, uh, with, uh, desiring, desiring with you about Fule. So the whole, this is this uh, 
organization called BOMSEC and others are trying and the DNA, DNA is so prominent in them. You must really have a DNA test so that we have a common legacy, a common origin. DNA is the other side as well. So invading other is the common and that goes very close to full leg. Of course they take their cue from Jyotira Phule to really gain some kind of a some kind of very problematic historical understanding. Uh, you have spelled it J-Y-O. I don't know whether you mentioned it or the publisher mentioned it, but uh, J-Y-O is Jyotiba. J-Y-O is a Sanskrit word. J-O-T-I, Jyoti. Jyoti is the the non Brahmin Kunvi word. That I, I got it from a translation of Gulamiri. Uh, that is GP Deshpande. Yeah. The he the, the mistake is in the original anyway, oh. forget about it. <laughs> 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 so uh, uh, this is the fourth thing that we have we have to ask them to read this book before they really go for this project of indigenizing and therefore the moment you indigenize you have to construct the other. And other is a very problematic thing, is it? It is not simply Aryan. It, others, Mlechas and Yamanas become other. So should we really do that? And what implication does it have for secularism that we talk about? Can you really construct this category as a very problematic category? And is it uh, theoretically sound and politically correct? Take, the, take a call on this. That's why this book is so important. It is raising really very sharp questions about this. Fifth. It also helps us to critically arrive at the normative judgment and enables us to associate we thinkers, this is reference to what Ravu was saying in the morning, it helps us to critically arrive at the normative judgment, judgment that will enable us to associate us with thinkers who are making tradition critical against Brahmanism. And you are thinking, and I have been listening to you reading, no historian in this, I have not seen, except even others, uh, are really talking about Brahmanism. It is a taboo. And therefore, your, 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 yours is a different analysis of that. Uh, you are talking about that that tradition which which other thinkers are making critical. For example, in your last uh, uh, your uh, Nikhil Chakravarti uh, memorial lecture, and I had the chance to listen to you through the YouTube. You are making this point. Uh, you are actually associating yourself with a tradition which is anti, which is non brahmin but and critic, critic, critical of Brahmanism, which you say the. Peria, Fule, and the Tanjavur person whose name I keep forgetting, <laughs> Sarfoji. And so that is one critical. So which, what is the set of thinkers with whom you want to associate? Thinkers who are seeking translation of tradition, not staying in the tradition, but translation of tradition. So this is the shifting boundaries and transforming boundaries or maybe annihilating boundaries. As against the thinkers who want to make traditions critical but for the extension of the tradition itself. So are you really therefore, and that's the issue I would like to have with uh, uh, Raghu. I mean, uh, in a way, if it is Vivekananda and you are mentioning three four Dayananda Saraswati and others in the nationalist context, Arbindo, Vivekananda, Dayananda Saraswati, <coughs> and even Gandhi. You don't mention Gandhi, you mention one of the three four of them. <coughs> Gandhi makes tradition critical. For what? To subvert it or extend it? And that's the question. And you are raising the same question differently. And you have, it has come up in the morning session as well. You know, so is there a complete departure from our own original station, our location? And so I think, uh, 
all these thinkers are actually using uh, their affinity, they are expressing their affinity with Aryan during the, during the freedom struggle. But you also make that point, and I'm just quickly submitting into consideration that for some reason Aryan as a category was never fascinating in the national discourse. Very important point. So this is the fourth, uh, fifth uh, justification I would like to uh, 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 reaffirm here. Uh, now the last one. From, and this is first, this is uh, this has relationship to my personal intellectual upbringing, my own trajectory, intellectual within quotes. <laughs> From her work, particularly on social history of Buddhism, so early Orient Longman publication, that's the only book that has really lasting impact on me, by the way. And then you have two volumes, The History of India, Ashoka, Penguin. Those early works, so those were the days I was really reading them very closely. Not for IIS. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When I was a student, in, so uh, everybody was reading those things because he wanted to discuss uh, issues of Buddhism. From her work, particularly on social history of Buddhism, early work published by Orient Longman, uh, History of India, and two volumes, what I have personally learned from these three volumes is that history is also a pedagogical exercise. History as pedagogy. Actually, I have, I have written something, you know, I just want to really impress upon you. I have written something on history as pedagogy and I have not published it so far. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me explain history as pedagogy by citing my own encounter with her work. But encounter is a very soft word, the Buddhism. Before I read her work, I thought, I read Ambedkar very carefully and thought, that since Ambedkar gave me the most refined version of Buddhism, in New Buddhism, I thought there was no reason to look at Buddhism more critically. Even, and I am suggesting that I, had, I hadn't read Ambedkar carefully then. Thus for, for me, reason became a faith in Ambedkar's New Buddhism. But after I read Professor Thapa's book, I developed the need to intensify my critical gaze at Buddhism, which has roots in Ambedkar. Looking at Buddhism critically has roots in Ambedkar. Therefore, there is a. I'm not shifting away from. I'm not changing my party. I'm with both of you in a way. Both Ambedkar and you. Now, this is the book. I'm going to discuss. This is the second part of my presentation. Do we have about yes. some some minutes? As he has, and I'm just repeating something you already mentioned. That how what is out of the four that is the problem. Out of the four and five you are listing the methodology of reading, reading, looking at history. One is of course archaeology, which you mentioned, and it is required to really understand the complex term like Aryan. Then the other one is uh, um, uh, historiography, of course, uh, intellectual field of reading, giving a full final treatment to concepts, as it, that is how we look at historiography. And that's why it's not simply facts and figures and collection of that. It is a different exercise altogether. But people have a very easy notion of historiography, and that we learn from what, uh, the treatment you are given and the, the discussion that took place in this time, time question was very suggestive of that. Then the other one is social anthropology. You are suggesting that as well. Very important. I, I don't know how... Uh, this... I have been... I have I've been finding it so difficult to make common cause with the historians. I had a big fight with them. Because... Not because... You are extending the boundaries of... Uh, uh, borders of uh, history so as to really have a very meaningful dialogue with social sciences. But some of the historians, for good reasons, I guess, develop some kind of individual consciousness of history. Individualizing history into that reified consciousness is really disenabling. You must open up that. And therefore, this four and the linguistic, 
the 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 methods of language is so important to understand aryan and you are actually focusing more on that and that really this method of really approaching aryan through <coughs> linguistic method is solving so many problems for us so uh, uh, this is uh, now the debatable point she has already mentioned in the morning that uh, the concept of aryan is so complex and you you cannot really offer a very conclusive <coughs> understanding of this concept it is all the time uh, making us uh, making it difficult for us to really offer a very conclusive understanding of the uh, concept of aryan but she has given us very very enabling picture of what is how to really locate the trajectory the conceptual trajectory of the aryan that is in the second uh, second second essay of in this book the theory of race aryan race uh so uh you uh, you are arguing and i am taking only the language you are arguing that you know Ar Ar aryan is not something which has come from outside and there are certain minor scale migrations of people who were speaking some kind of indo aryan language and and therefore it was it is not wholesale migration of language that has come from uh, afghanistan and that place you are making another important point once the language comes you say that the spread of language does not have to be linked with overwhelming number of people and this is a very important point as far as i can see in the context of sanskrit being imposed as the language of homogenization today there are several languages 28 29 many languages are there and but that is that is a very rhetorical point and we are not at the moment interested in rhetorical point what we are interested is that the genealogy of this language the concept uh, the, 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 the the concept of aryan and language if it is a language category as you say and i agree with you and I'm, i don't require my agreement anyway Uh, so language is not and i'm just putting in my own words <coughs> language is not the function of number and vice versa i mean you don't require many people to follow language it can exist on its own strength but why are people really insisting that people should really speak one kind of language that's the fantastic very enabling powerful insight we get from people you have to decode it popularize it and so i thought that was so therefore they, they came with mind and the language but then it became a aryan is not physical entity aryan 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 is not also a strictly geographical entity it is a label of language and label of language just as aryan Arya, people speaking Aryan are people, and they are called Aryan. They get some personal status, and there is no physical characterization that you achieve through this language. Just as we have Dravid, Dravid, Dravidian is a label, language label. So you are, in a way, actually insulating this whole question of Aryan from being politicized. You are actually locating it so accurately in terms of its own evolution. to linguistic uh, transformation at uh, the linguistic tech so uh, uh, uh so this is an important point i thought uh, you were making in in your uh, and therefore your munda munda of course is one important point you know and they say the jokudali munda in what there's a different connotation munda in punjabi language i think uh, so, so. <laughs> so these are all uh, so these are very important the dravidian munda uh, and aryan these are all labels and that we have to treat them as labels 
and they are not physical. They are not. They are not physical characterization of any any person. Important third point. I am just summarizing. C argues, and we must keep that in mind. Particularly the young scholars. I am also young. Uh, <laughs> C argues no permanent socio-economic rituals and language between Aryan and Dasa. There was no permanent language. Language as a category, and Aryan as a category was always evolving, leading to identities, and identities are changing all the time. I, therefore, it will be unfair to put her into some box, some kind of a Marxist scholar who is unavailable for any kind of negotiation. No, she is not taking, she is actually making this point, look here. I am not making a claim to make definitive judgments. That's how you start with. You know, I am not making any claim to make definitive judgments and conclusions. I am actually making field, I am rendering field open for free inquiry. And this is what we were discussing Devika yesterday, and that somewhere about you have, you have been discussed since yesterday. So, uh, so that's the, uh, the, the that's I think uh, important point. That you you are actually following certain decent academic <coughs> methodological protocols. I don't know why people really the moment you you speak people have some image of you, but you have become an idea. You are not image. <laughs> I'm sure that's it. So this is and then uh, another, uh, in another. Uh, Second section, and in the first section, you also separate caste from uh, a race and other things. Too. This is also very important. Race and caste are separate. Second, uh, in the second uh, essay, uh, the damage is done by the comparative philology uh, scholars, and Max Muller is leading them, collapsing everything into race and caste. An Aryan, Bland, branding Ramon Ra as Aryan, you mentioned your thing there. And so, therefore, whole thesis, I mean, whole, whole thesis of separation and elevated discussion become uh, issues of uh, setback. But in, uh, but in, but during the colonial period, uh, as you very rightly said. Uh, sorry, in the nationalist struggle, uh, Aryan as a category did not really interest people. It was not uh, important for them to use Aryan as a category, Just except Adhyan and Saswati's Arya Samaj and other people, but it was not the mobilizing category. But you have Tilak and Jyotira Phule. Who is sharing the same discursive ground? Saying that, uh, in a way, the fullest, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, and you, meant, you, you write very copiously on, on both, the, both the figures. Uh, Tilak is considering Aryans as like, outsiders, Arctic, Arctic Homo Aryans, Central Asia. And the missionaries, you also quote the missionary sources. And um, and and uh, Jyotira Phule is the Iranian Brahmins, and they have come from there. But I also want to. I just wanted to also know from you. <coughs> this I was told. I don't know. I don't. I'm looking for the uh, evidence. But you will help me in this. This Jena, from where did you get this holy belt? Holy belt is Max Weber's term. Holy belt. From where did we get it? Was it Indian origin or something? Did we ever have a tradition of growing cotton in this country so that we could really make holy belts? And I was told that it has come from Iran. I know, I, I just want to find out. Uh, so, uh, but then Jyoti Rao said they are from outside. Outside, and you you have given some very uh, uh, insightful account of that. And uh, they were Aryan speaking uh, uh, Sanskrit, Sanskrit speaking people, Aryans, and therefore we heard, uh, uh, and then there is opposition. 
and there's a fa there is an emphasis on indigenousness and all that and you suddenly you definitely disagree with them with both that basically jyoti rao and i also disagree with him i disagree with him from the point of view of ambedkar and that's the question i'm asking raising uh, in my uh, uh, in my uh, response to your your book so i uh, i uh, this so i uh, I would like to uh, summarize this book. I have just made some points which are so important today. There are several points inside, but I am just trying to now summarize three chapters in following manner. Please forgive me, and uh, if I am sounding to be so uh, unintelligible. Aryans are historically constituted. I'm just summarizing this. They are social, culturally produced and reproduced, and li linguistically familiarized and communicated, and of course politically articulated and asserted. And you that you see that assertion today. And therefore, you have, we have to go. Uh, we you you have to therefore really disabuse. the term aryan through conceptual theoretical force and trust now i am already suggesting that all those people who are affected by aryan should take this book seriously now uh, mera can i just uh, some uh, uh, you have got the uh, questions you know yeah but i have my uh, I'm just raising two points. Uh, one point is, should I start with this? That you are you put the hyphen between the Lit and Bohemian, but the hyphen is tenable. But I think this the small hyphen, not the extreme level of hyphen. Uh, that is my uh, really, just just because you know Aryans are now uh, they 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 are obviously becoming more more Aryanized. Uh, while it is historically historically true that the politics of solidarity did introduce the hyphen between these two words, the Dalits and the Bohemian, yet this hyphen cannot be stretched too far for historical reasons. what i argue is that there is both ontological as well as epistemological limit that has been imposed by the changing configuration of social power and ambedkar's critique of bohemian is so prominent and that we don't discuss because we will not be politically correct but in the event of this whole thing obc's whole political makeup and their own consciousness we have to raise this point i mean without any favor and fear In the light of this claim, we find some ground on which we can engage with Professor Thakur at least on the following issues. One, there is a differential reading of concept of Aryan within the Dalit Bohemian discourse, and the, this reading seeks deviation from the reading of Fule. Ambedkar is actually not buying into Fule. This internal critique, and when we we are talking about critique in the earlier uh, earlier uh, in the in the Swarajian ideas thing also, and even in uh, Raghu's thing. the what is tradition and i thought you know uh, there are two words uh, two uh, two books particularly dealing with history one is history as philosophy philosophy in history by right richard rorty and spinter skinner fact uh, <coughs> where you dealt with philosophy and history so seriously and that one and the quinton skinner's book what is tradition tradition is tradition which is internally flowing and critical not it doesn't foreclose it is flowing so ambedkar belongs to that tradition of association starting from buddha kabir down to phule but disagreeing with everybody new buddhism and he doesn't agree with phule that look here aryans have one come from outside and they agree with you and didiko sami by the way they have they have come from outside and there is no relation between relationship there is no There is no relationship between color, flesh, 
and your caste, they are different, they are different things. And therefore, uh, Ambedkar is making this point, quoting on some, uh, some uh, <coughs> British sources, uh, anthropologists, uh, uh, census commissioners, social anthropologists, and saying that there is a difference between race and caste. You can't collapse. But this is not the question for you and me, but it is for those people who are internationalizing caste. Don't package Ambedkar the way you want to package him. He is asking question to Foley. And therefore, these, those who are looking for indigenous thing, roots, should also read Ambedkar. But these people don't read Ambedkar. They read selectively Foley. Because Foley helps them to really confirm their uh, political agenda. Support their political agenda. So this is one. This I thought there is some discussion on Ambedkar, uh, which is uh, which I would like you to next. I would just uh, uh, request you to do something on Ambedkar next time when you speak. Uh, to put it straightforward, man, Ambedkar radically disagreed with Fule in understanding Aryan. Aryan, but he is using the help of the language that you are using, Indo-Aryans, in Aryan society, Indo-Aryan society. And all that he's using, and he's saying that there's a lean, not there's a non-linear understanding. But Aryan Dasas were also Aryans. You also make that point. There's a dis discrepancy. Not quite. Not quite. Okay. Good. So, misreading. Uh, <laughs> second, interestingly, there is a remarkable closeness between them, and so this is the point I'm not repeating. So this, one can read therefore. Uh, uh, Romila Tapar, D.D. Kosambi and, and Ambedkar together, excluding fully. And therefore you can also develop the critique of O. Handlen, G.P. Deshpande and Gila Ahmed because they are giving us some kind of a cultural, only cultural understanding, cultural uh, interpretation of the whole trajectory of Aryan. And the notion of Bali Raja that you bring in, just to, uh, that is also very, very fascinating. <coughs> Uh, Bali Raja is the legendary figure in the Hokyadvarya uh, Phule anti brahmin movement. Bali Raja is a Daitya and who who is uh, who's being, who is through the cunning of this Vamana who is the incarnation of Vishnu, is sending him into the Patala. Uh, so that memory and you're talking about memory. Memory is in favor of Bali Raja. On the first day of Diwali, everywhere in, I think, northern Karnataka and full of Maharashtra, you say, the women particularly say, Ida Zao, Pira Zao, and Bali Jai Raja Yo. All our suffering should go away and let us really invite, let us welcome, let us really uh, summon, summon Bali Raja, Bali Raja. And all that is the part of Bali Raja, the most progressive, Bali Raja, the pro poor, pro peasant Raja, Bali Raja, the most democratic Raja, and against the grain. So that is uh, that discussion is covered in your in, a, in your uh, your book. Uh, so uh, that's it. I have only two points. So I should stop here and uh, uh, don't ask me questions. Well, you can ask questions to Professor Ramila Thapa. Thank you very much. Madam. I sit there. Okay. Just so that if you want to interject, you are welcome to interject. Interjections. Uh, so while um, Professor Thapa takes the stage, I have a small anecdotal example model for all of you. When we used to play games, the ball sometimes used to just circulate between two main players and the rest of us used to just stand and stare at the ball. So in the question answer session, I request that this become an open platform where people are not just having one-on-one -on -one conversation and the questions. I welcome you to clarify your questions and add uh, depth to the questions, but I would rather that the debate opens up to the larger, there's lots of time till 4.25. 30. So, I would request you to keep your questions brief, but also engage and welcome the other people also to participate equally and not just keep passing question answer question answer. Thank you. Um, maybe have a show of hands. Uh, we'll have uh, Thapa respond to this. 
Yes, I, I was, um, to begin with, very interested in um, uh, your, your juxtaposing Ambedkar with Pune, um, because they are different. And of course, m my interest in the difference was because, historically, I was seeing Pune as the counterweight to Tilak, and Ambedkar much later. And I had the feeling that uh, Fule is writing very deliberately, examining the question from a distinctly d different point of view, socially, than Tilak. Tilak is the normal Maharashtra, Maharashtra Brahman, and he's reflecting those views. Uh, even this whole absurdity of the Aryans originated in the Arctic homeland, and, came all trekking all the way down into India from the Arctic homeland, uh, to which I don't know whether you're familiar with this. When he was questioned about this and said, how could they in those days have trekked all the way from the Arctic down to, to India? Uh, he said, no, no, it was possible. And then there was someone called um, R.C. Das in Bengal who wrote an entire book to prove that the Arctic homeland was located in Bihar. <laughs> <laughs> so the trek was possible. No, I, I mean, you know, sometimes you come across this kind of information and you think, what are the extents to which people went to make historical positions? But there it was. Anyway, so I think that, that Pune has to be seen very much in terms of he's the man who's contesting the luck. And, and that contestation is, is extremely interesting. I mean, I don't go into it because I'm only concerned with the whole business of how they saw the Aryans. Um, but Fule does talk about the Brahmins. The Aryans are Brahmins who came in and oppressed the Kshatriyas and uh, the lower castes. Yes. Mm. Uh, Ambedkar's position is much stronger where he talks about dominant castes and subordinate castes. You know, the Aryan element is perhaps not so central as the fact that you have in the caste system a hierarchy of the dominant caste and the subordinate caste, which is which is extremely important. Um, now, again, there is an ambivalence. Tilak doesn't say it's invasion; he says it's a migration from outside. Whereas Fule, of course, projects it very much as an invasion and therefore the oppression of the existing people. Um, the Brahmins were superior and they came and conquered. Um, slightly with the image, I think, of colonialism. The, perhaps the unconscious image of the devastation and the oppression that conquerors can establish. Because, I mean, you know, one, is, one reads a lot of history books about invasions and conquests, and yet you never really get the feel of, of how devastating it is. But if you're actually living in a situation where you've been conquered and, and, and you're living in that situation, then it becomes a much more intense experience. Um, the Shudras, of course, consist of diverse groups. It's interesting that in Fule, it's everybody from the Kshatriyas down. It's not just the OBCs and the Dalits, but it's everybody who is non-Brahman. It's essentially Brahman, non-Brahman non uh, at one level. And I think that's, that makes a very interesting uh, uh, difference. Uh, the Shudras are diverse groups unified by the one main thing, which is the disabilities of the normative code, the Manu's code. The disabilities that they all have to suffer is an aspect of the unification of uh, what we would today call OBCs and uh, Dalits. Um, one of the things that interested me not when I was writing then, but when I was reading your questions and when I was thinking about it, is that today, um, 
I think we really have to go into this question much more as to why Dalits want to become Aryans. You know, it's been brushed over by saying, well, obviously it's the upper caste image, it's the upper caste culture, they're against caste, they want to declare their hostility. But they want to declare their hostility to that culture and yet they want to be a part of that culture. Now, this I find extremely intriguing, that you object to Manu's code and yet you want to be a part of the society that Manu is talking about, because Manu is very strong on this business of being an Arya and all the rest of it and what it entails. Um, and I began to wonder that why is it that some Dalit historian hasn't thought up a new idea, which is not exactly new. It has been touched on by historians, a couple of historians, uh, but which I've discussed, I think, in the fourth lecture. No, yeah. I didn't go there. Oh, you didn't get there. All right, never mind. Uh, it's, it's at the moment a very marginal idea, but I think it has great potential. So please don't quote me on this, but <laughs> let me mention it to you. Um, why has it not, if, if one accepts, which of course the, the Fule tradition doesn't, uh, but Ambedkar does, that there was a migration of Aryan speakers, not an invasion. And by migration, I mean when I talk about migration, I mean what we as, as children used to call it, in English I think it's called a leapfrogging migration. Uh, one person bends down and the other person comes and they put their hands on the back of the person who's bent down and they leap over and they get there. And then they stand there and, and someone else comes along and they bend down and they leap over and they get there. Now that kind of migration means small communities that come in and settle down amongst a variety of other people somewhat something of a common culture begins to emerge and then somebody from that community A uh, leapfrogs out and creates community B in another area and then another little culture develops and then community B leapfrogs out and goes and creates community C. Now in that sort of situation, if that is what the migration is about, then the question of how did the language spread, which for me is a very important question in which uh, Professor Gopalgur also referred to, becomes a very central issue. It's not the invasion or you know how did they come and so on, but the spread of the language and the culture becomes very important because within that spread is the whole question of what is the society that is being created then perhaps one begins to see that what many people have called Vedic Brahmanism, the particular Brahmanism of the, of the Vedic texts of the Vedic times, is a society on the defensive. And I think that this is perhaps an idea that needs to be investigated. I have not done it, but I think it's something that needs to be investigated. To what extent was there a feeling that somehow uh, the values that they had brought in with them as migrants and which had got mixed and merged and so on, uh, were values that were not being accepted fully and completely by everybody and therefore there's a sort of distancing and a feeling that, you know, this is us, this is we, this is our culture, that's their culture. The reason why I say this is that there is, in fact, a fairly strong discrimination in the Rig Veda, which is the earliest of the texts, and probably dating around at least the 13th and 12th century BC. Uh, there's very strong feeling of um, Arya Varna and Dasa Varna. This is much before the four Varnas. Who are the Arya Varna and who are the Dasa Varna? The Dasa Varna, in particular. Uh, they are people who do not speak our language. Uh, they are people who don't worship our gods. They don't observe our rituals. Their custom is different. Um, 
they may be, there's a controversy about whether they looked different. Is it anasa? Is it anaasa? Which makes a difference between not having a nose, not having an orifice, a mouth. If it's not having a nose, then you're down to flat-nosed people who are physically distinctive. If you don't have a mouth, you're virtually saying they don't speak our language. That is a mythological way of mentioning it perhaps. Anyway, that is a little doubtful. But otherwise, it's very much a case of us and them. The Dasas live in forts. They have a lot of cattle. We don't know whether it's forts or whether they live in, 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 in stockaded enclosures. And they have a lot of cattle wealth. They're very wealthy. And there's a tremendous envy. We, we have to go out and raid their cattle and bring it back. And it, it's true that there's no mention of invasion, but there's a lot of mention of these cattle raids and skirmishes, which is, of course, as we know from medieval hero stones, cattle raids are a given feature of Indian history from the beginning right up to medieval times. But what is interesting, um, this has been noticed and passed by, by many historians, but was pointed out by Didi Kosambi in a slightly more pertinent manner. Uh, there are references to perhaps some dasas getting integrated, and getting integrated at a level of society where you wouldn't think they would be integrated so easily. Uh, Didi Kosambi refers to this curious phrase in the later Vedic texts, the Brahmanas, uh, Dasi Putraha Brahman. Does this mean a Brahman who is the son of a slave woman? Or does it mean a Brahman who is the son of someone who belongs to the Dasa community? I think this is an interesting difference that needs to be worked out. And we, nobody's really tackled it. Um, so that leads to the very interesting question that if at the level of the Brahmins you could have a mixed category of this kind, and not even mixed, they're pure, they're Dasi Putraha, except that some of the illustrations that are given later on of people uh, like Veer uh, Ghatama who marries a um, Dasi, Usheja, and produces a son, a very, very famous Rishi, who plays an extremely important part in the Vedic texts, uh, Kakshivan, and who uh, is always talked about as being a very revered Rishi from the past, um, patronized by Indra. Now, you know, that really is high qualification altogether in Vedic terms. Why is he called a Dasi Putra Brahma? Um, this is something that has to be explained. It can be one of two things. It can be that there were, and then there is the other one, also very, very revered, um, Kavash Ailusha. Uh, again, described as a Dasi Putra Brahma. Um, what does it mean? Either that there were some Brahmins who were from the Dasa community who were brought into the Brahman fold and became Brahmins, uh, or through birth, through the slave women who worked, the Dasis who worked in uh, homes of the Aryas. Aryas. Um, and we know that this was the case because in the Rig Veda, again, you have what are called the Dhanasthuti, <coughs> uh, where the poet is praising the chief who has gone out and conducted a cattle raid. And when he comes back, the poet writes a poem in praise of the chief. He was great, he did wonderful things, he did this, he destroyed so-and-so, he killed so-and-so, and so forth. And he has given me a very generous present consisting of 10,000 head of horse, 60,000 head of cattle, this, 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 and 50 dasis. So, our dasis now chattel, an item of wealth. Um, so, it's a little ambiguous as to what the word 
Dasi means in this context. It could be either of the two. But what is interesting is, of course, the stories that are associated with them. In the one case, the Brahmins are looking down upon uh, the Dasi Gutra Brahmins as being inferior. But when they start the ritual, when the Yajna starts, the Saraswati river comes and touches the feet of the Dasi Putra Brahman. So immediately the other Brahmins say, oh, these guys are really absolutely top class. And they induct them into their fold and make them into regular Brahmins. Now, the fact that this is happening, um, even though it's not mentioned too frequently, but there are these very famous figures of rishis who are associated with this also leads to the other possibility, which one or two people have discussed in passing, that were, was the Dasa population that survived with the coming in of the migrant Aryans, perhaps the remnants of the late Harappans. Not the actual Harappans, because the Harappan cities declined around 1700, and the Rigved doesn't really get to be written till about 1300. There's 500 years in between. Um, there's 500 years where you may have had some settlements with some ritual specialists and much mythology. And this is where the issue of what we were discussing this morning, collective memory. Mythology, after all, is collective memory of some kind, much worked upon, changed, uh, different contours from time to time, but there might somewhere be a hint of something that goes back to earlier times. So do we then have to think of the possibility that some of the mythology, at least, in the Rig Ved, and possibly in the later Vedic texts as well, could have gone back to Harappan times? Just some elements of it. Um, I mean, the reason why I, I haven't discussed this in any of my books is because it needs a tremendous amount of research before anything on this of this lines can be said with any kind of categorical uh, insistence that it might have been so. A tremendous amount of research. And one doesn't want to float half-baked ideas which then get hit upon and then one gets described in all kinds of abusive terms. But. Um, but this is just one possibility, and, 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 and this possibility becomes feasible if you think of this period, as I was saying this morning, and as uh, Professor Gopal Guru also mentioned just now, as being a period in which you use language, linguistics, archaeology, historiography, genetics, and social anthropology. How do people speaking another language when they arrive as pastoral migrants in the midst of a settled community, what is the way in which they interact with each other? This has been discussed by social anthropologists, and we have to turn to those discussions to ask questions, not to find answers, to ask questions about how the situation might have been in the Indian context. So that is, in fact, uh, an important. Now, yes, what, I, what started me off on this was that would it not be more politically purposeful if the Dalits were to say, we are those Dasas, and we have an inheritance from possibly the Indus civilization, which some have said, this is not a completely alien idea. There are some people who have said that the original inhabitants that Fule talks about are precisely the Dasas and probably now the Harappans, that has been said. But I'm saying this more in the sense of if there were Dasi Putra Brahmans, then who were they? Were they Dasas? And if there were Dasas and there were local people of low caste, then the Brahman Varn is a combination of what came from outside and what was locally available. This puts a very, very different uh, aspect onto the whole discussion. Exclusive as well. Hmm? Exclusive as well. 
They're very exclusive, yes. But, I mean, which is why I've kept silent on it. I, I, you know, if someone said, either are these your ideas? I would say, no, they're not my ideas. So please, nobody quote me on this. I have enough to contend with. Uh, but I would have thought that this would be politically much more forceful than saying we all want to be Aryas. Hmm? And I'm just intrigued that, you know, this... I mean, it has been hinted at by various people, but somehow it was not not taken up. And what is the great attraction of insisting that you were also Arias when in fact you would insist on something uh, much more dramatic than that? But anyway, that's uh, one thing. Yeah, the Dalit hyphen Bahujan. Uh, I think this is a historically placed hyphen. That is that originally in the texts, the separation between uh, the non-Dalits and the Dalits is very sharp, very distinctive, and there's no way in which uh, the, there can be any kind of bridge between the two. I mean, they are out, the Dalits are outside the caste system, leave alone being anything else. They're simply outside. They, 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 don't, they don't matter at all. And then you get the coming in of the lower caste, the OBCs, beginning to play a role, beginning to assert a certain existence. And then it becomes convenient to hyphenate it and talk about Dalit Bahujans because you get a larger body of people coming in. So I think that that is a, a historical thing. Um, Baliraj, yes, it is absolutely fascinating, the whole myth of Baliraj because um, it is a myth that converts, it, it's the inversion, not just uh, that the, you know, that the Aryans uh, uh, bring him in as an evil person, but the, the um, Fule myth converts the Daitya into a deity, uh, so that his character changes completely and therefore the role that he is playing also changes and then it becomes a myth where not only is the the evil one converted into a good one but it's a myth of morality because those that were associated with goodness earlier behave in an equal in a, in a terribly immoral evil manner they deceive uh, bali and he has to undergo this problem. So I think that that is again a myth which is not just, you know, the, 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 the heroes of the Aryans were turned into the devils and the devils of the Aryans became the heroes, uh, which incidentally is not the first time this happened because this happened also in the relationship between the Indo-Aryans and the old Iranian Aryans where the Iranians, for the Iranians, people like uh, 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 the, the gods, the devas, uh, were really the, the daityas of the Rigved, and they reversed the roles of people like Indra and so on. Um, but, but I thought that the, the myth of Bali has many dimensions, both of the story dimension and the reversal of the story, as well as the value system of righteousness and morality that is associated with the story. I think that's all I have to say. No, no.